What the Bell Saw and Said by Louisa May Alcott Bells ring others to church, but go not in themselves. No one saw the spirits of the bells up there in the steeple at midnight on Christmas Eve. Six quaint figures, each wrapped in a shadowy cloak and wearing a bell-shaped cap. All were gray-headed, for they were among the oldest bell spirits in the city, and the light of old days shone in their thoughtful eyes. Silently they sat, looking down on the snow-covered roofs, glittering in the moonlight, and the quiet streets deserted by all but the watchmen of their chilly rounds and such poor souls as wander shelterless in the winter night. Presently one of the spirits said, in a tone which, low as it was, filled the belfry with reverberating echoes, Well, brothers, are the, your reports ready of the year that now lies dying? All bowed their heads, and one of the oldest answered in a sonor sonorous voice, My report isn't all I could wish. You know, I look down on the commercial part of our city and have fine opportunities for selling what goes on there. It's my business to watch the businessmen, and upon my word, I heartily ashamed of them sometimes. During the war, they did nobly, giving their time and money, their sons and selves to the good cause, and I was proud of them. But now too many of them have fallen back into their old ways, and their motto seems to be, everyone for himself, and the devil take the mo the hindmost, cheating and lying and stealing are hard words, and I don't mean to imply them to all who swarm about below there like ants on an anthill. They have other names for these things, but I'm old-fashioned and use plain words. There's a deal too much dishonesty in the world, and business seems to have become a giant hazard, a, a game of hazard in which luck, not labor, wins the prize. When I was young, men were years making moderate mis moderate fortunes and were satisfied with them. They built them on sure foundations, knew how to enjoy them while they lived, and to leave a good name behind them when they died. Now it's anything for money. Health, happiness, honor, life itself are flung down on that great gaming table, and they forget everything else in the excitement of success or the desperation of defeat. Nobody seems satisfied either, for those who win have little time or taste to enjoy their prosperity, and those who lose have little courage or patience to support them in adversity. They don't even fail as they used to. In my day, when a merchant found himself embarrassed, he didn't ruin others in order to save himself, but honestly confessed the truth, gave up everything, and began again. But nowadays, after all manner of dishonorable shifts, there comes a grand crash. Many suffer, but some. But by some hocus pocus, the merchant saves enough to retire upon and live comfortably, here or abroad. It's very evident that honor and honesty doesn't mean now what they used to mean back in the days of May, Higginson, and Lawrence. They preach below here, and very well too sometimes, for I often slide down the rope for peep, to peep and listen during service. But bless you, they don't seem to lay either sermon, psalm, or prayer to heart, for while the minister is doing his best, the congregation, tired with the breathless hurry of the week, sleep peacefully, calculate their chances for the morrow, or wonder which of their neighbors will lose or win in the great game. Don't tell me. I've seen them do it. And if I dared, I'd have startled every soul of them with a rising peal. Uh, they don't dream whose eye is on them. They never guess what secrets the telegraph wires tell as the messages fly by. And little know what a report I give to the winds of heaven as I ring out above them morning, noon, and night. And the old spirit shook his head till the tassel on his gap jangled like a little bell. There are some, however, whom I love and honor, he said, in a benignant tone, who honestly earn their bread, who deserve all the success that comes to them, and always keep a warm corner in their noble hearts for those less blessed than they. These are the men who serve the city in times of peace, 
save it in times of war, and deserve the highest honors in its gift, and leave behind them a record that keeps their memories green. For such and one we lately told Anel, my brothers and our united voices, pealed over the city, in all grateful hearts, sweeter and more solemn than any chime, rung the words that made him so beloved. Treat our dead boys tenderly, and send them home to me. He ceased, and all spirits rever reverently co uncovered their gray heads as a strain of music floated up from the sleeping city and died among the stars. Like yours, my report is not satisfactory in all respects. Began the second spirit, who wore a very pointed cap and finely ornamental, ornamented cloak, but through his dress with, was fresh and youthful, his face was old, and he had nodded several times during his brother's speech. My greatest affliction during the past year has been the terrible extravagance which prevails. My post, as you know, is at the court end of the city, and I see all the fashionable vices and follies. It is a marvel to me how so many of these immortal creatures, with such opportunities for usefulness, self-improvement, and genuine happiness, can be content to go round and round in one narrow circle of unprofitable and unsatisfactory pursuits. I do my best to warn them, Sunday after Sunday. I chime in their ears the beautiful old hymns and sweetly chide or cheer the hearts that truly listen and believe. Sunday after Sunday, I look down on them as they pass in, hoping to see that my words have not fallen upon deaf ears. And Sunday after Sunday, they listen to words that should teach them much. It seems to go by them like the wind. They are told to love their neighbor, yet too many hate them, hate him because he possesses more of the world's goods or honors than they. They are told that a rich man cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, yet they go on laying up perishable wealth. And, and though often warned that moth and rust will corrupt, they fail to believe it till the worm that destroys enters and mars their own chapel of ease. Being a spirit, I see below external splendor and find much poverty of heart and soul under the velvet and the ermine which should cover rich and royal natures. Our city saints walk abroad in threadbare suits and under quiet bonnets shine their eyes that make sunshine in the shady places. Often as I watch the glittering procession passing to and fro below me, I wonder if, with all our progress, there is today as much real piety as in the times when our fathers, poorly clad, with weapons in one hand and Bible in the other, came weary distances to worship in the wilderness with fervent faith, unquenched by danger, suffering, and solitude. Yet in spite of my fault finding, I love my children, as I call them, for all not butterflies. Many find wealth no temptation to forgetfulness of duty or hardness of heart. Many give freely of their abundance, pity the poor, comfort the afflicted, and make our city loved and honored in, our, in other lands as in our own. They have their cares, losses, and heartaches as well as, the, as well as the poor. It isn't all sunshine with them, and they learn, poor souls, that into each life some rain must fall, some days must be dark and dreary. But I have hopes of them, and lately they have had a teacher so genial, so gifted, so well beloved, that all who listen to him must be better for the lessons of charity, goodwill, and cheerfulness, which he brings home to them like the magic of tears and smiles. We know him, we love him, we always remember him as the year comes round. And the blithest song of our brazen tongues utter is a Christmas carol to the father of the chimes. As the spirit spoke, his voice grew cheery, his old face shone, and in a burst of hearty enthusiasm, he flung up his cap and cheered like a boy. So did the others, and as the fairy shout echoed through the belfry, a troop of shadowy figures, with faces lovely or grotesque, tragical or gay, sailed by on the wings of wintry wind and waved their hands to the spirits of the bells. As the excitement subsided and the spirits receded themselves, looking ten years younger for that burst, another spoke, a venerable brother in a dingy mantle, with a tuneful voice and eyes that seemed to have grown sad 
with looking on much misery. He loves the poor, the man we've just trod for, and he makes others love and remember them. Bless him, said the spirit. I hope he'll touch the hearts of those who listen to him here and beguile them to open their hands to my ha unhappy children over yonder. If I could set some of the forlorn souls in my parish beside the happier creatures who weep over imaginary woes as they are painted by his eloquent lips, that brilliant scene would be better than any sermon. Day and night I look down on lives as full of sin, self-sacrifice, and suffering as any of those famous books. Day and night I try to com comfort the poor by my cheery voice and to make their wants known by proclaiming them with all my might. But people seem to be so intent on business, pleasure, or home duties that have no time to hear and answer my appeal. There's a deal of charity in this good city, and when the people do wake up, they work with a will. But I can't help thinking that if some of the money lavished on luxuries was spent on necessaries for the poor, there would be fewer tragedies like that which ended yesterday. It's a short story, easy to tell, though long and hard to live. Listen to it. Down yonder, in the garret of one of the squalid houses at the foot of my tower, a little girl has lived for a year, fighting silently and single-handed a good fight against poverty and sin. I saw when she first came, a hopeful, cheerful, brave, hearted little soul, alone, yet not afraid. She used to sit all day, sewing at her window, and her lamp burnt far into the night, for she was very poor, and all she earned would barely give her food and shelter. I watched her feed the doves, who seemed to be her only friends. She never forgot them, and daily gave them a few crumbs that fell from her, her meager table. But there was no kind hand to feed and foster the, the little human dove, and so she starved. For a while, she worked bravely, but the poor three dollars a week would not clothe and feed and warm her. The things her busy fingers made sold enough to keep her comfortably if she had received it. I saw the pretty color fade from her cheeks. Her eyes grew hollow. Her voice lost its cheery ring. Her st step its elasticity, and her face began to wear the haggard, anxious look that made its youth doubly pathetic. Her poor little gowns grew shabby, her shawl so thin she shivered when the pitiless wind smote her and her feet were almost bare. Rain and snow beat on the patient little figure going to and fro, each morning with hope and courage faintly shining, each evening with the shadow of despair gathering darker around her. It was a hard time for all, desperately hard for her, and in her poverty, sin and pleasure tempted her. She resisted, but as another Bitter winter, came, bitter winter came, she feared that in her misery she might yield, for body and soul were weakened now by the long struggle. She knew not where to turn for help. There seemed to be no place for her at any safe and happy fireside. Life's hard aspect daunted her, and she turned to death, saying confidingly, Take me while I'm innocent and not afraid to go. I saw it all. I saw how she sold everything that would bring her money and paid her little debts to the utmost penny. How she set her poor room in order for the, the last time. How she tenderly bade the doves bade the doves goodbye, and lay down on her bed to die. At nine o'clock last night, as my bell rang over the city, I tried to tell that was going on in the garret where the light was dying out so fast. I cried to them with all my strength. Kind souls below there, fellow creature is perishing for lack of charity. Oh, help her before it is too late. Mothers with little daughters on your knees, stretch out your hands and take her in. Happy woman in a safe shelter of home. Think of her desolation. Rich men who grind the faces of the poor, remember that this soul will one day be required of you. Dear Lord, let not this little sparrow fall to the ground. Help Christian men and women. In the name of him whose birthday bless the world, Ah, me, I rang and clashed and cried in vain. The passers-by only said, as they hurried home, laden with Christmas cheer, The old bells is merry tonight, as it should be at this blithe season, bless it. As the clock struck ten, the poor child lay down, saying as she drank the last bitter drought life could give her, It's very cold, 
but I, but soon I shall not feel it. With her quiet eyes fixed on the cross that glimmered in the moonlight above me, she lay waiting for the sleep that needs no lullaby. As the men struck eleven, pain and poverty for her were, were over. It was bitter cold, but she no longer felt it. She lay serenely sleeping with tired hearts and hands at rest forever. As the clock struck twelve, the dear Lord remembered her and with fatherly hand led her into the home where there is room for all. Today I wrung her now, and though my heart was heavy, yet my soul was glad, for in spite of all her human woe and weakness, I am sure that little girl will keep a joyful Christmas up in heaven. In the silence, which the spirits for a moment kept, a breath of softer air than any of the snowy world below swept through the steeple and seemed to whisper, yes, a vast, there, fond as I am of salt water, I don't like this kind, cried the breezy voice of the fourth spirit, who had a tiny ship instead of a tassel on his cap, and who wiped his wet eyes with the sleeve of his rough blue cloak. It won't take me long to spin my yarn, for things are pretty taut and ship shape aboard our craft. Captain Taylor is an experienced sailor, and has brought many ships safely into port, in spite of wind and tide and the devil's own whirlpools and hurricanes. If you want to see earnestness come aboard some Sunday when the captain's on the quarter deck and take an observation, no danger of falling asleep there, no more there is up aloft. When the stormy winds do blow, consciousness get raked fore and aft, sins are blown clean out of the water, false colors are hauled down, and true ones run up to the masthead, and many an immortal soul is warned to steer off in time from the pirates' rocks and quicksands of temptation. He's a regular revolving light, is the captain, a beacon always burning and saying plainly, here are lifeboats ready to put off in all weathers and bring the shipwrecked into quiet waters. He comes but seldom now, being laid up in the home dock, tranquilly waiting till his turn comes to go out with the tide and safely ride an anchor in the great harbor of the Lord. Our crew varies a good deal. Some of them have rather rough voyages and come into port pretty well battered. Land sharks fall foul of many, a good many, and do a deal of damage. Most of them ca carry brave and tender hearts under the blue jackets. For their rough nurse, the sea manages to keep something of the child alive in the grayest old tar that makes the world his picture book. We try to supply him with life preservers while at sea, make him feel sure of a hearty welcome when ashore. And I believe the year 67 we sail away into eternity with a satisfactory cargo. Brother North End made me pipe my eye, so I'll try to make him laugh to pay for it by telling a clerical joke I heard the other day. Below, Bellows didn't make it, though he might have done so, as he's a connection of ours and knows how to use his tongue as well as any of us, speaking of the bells of a certain town, a reverend gentleman affirmed that each bell uttered an appropriate remark so plainly that the words were audible to all. The Baptist bell cried briskly, Come up and be dipped. Come up and be dipped. The Episcopal bell slowly said, Apostolical succession. Apostolical, apostolic succession. Orthodox bell solemnly pronounced, Eternal damnation, eternal damnation. And the Methodist shouted, invitingly, room for all, room for all, as the spirit imitated the various calls, as only a jovial bell sprite could. The others gave him a chime of laughter and vowed they would each adopt some tuneful summons, which should reach human ears and draw human feet more willingly to church. Faith, brother, you've kept your word and got the laugh out of us, cried a stout, sleek spirit with a kindly face and a row of little saints round his cap and a rosary at his side. It's very well we are doing this year. The cathedral is full, the flock is increasing, and the true faith holding its own entirely. You may shake your heads if you will and fear there be trouble, but I doubt it. We've warm hearts of our own, and the best of us don't forget 
that when we were starving, America, the saints blessed the jewel, sent us bread. And we were dying for lack of work. America opened her arms and took us in, and now helps us build churches, homes, and schools by giving us a share of the riches all men work for and win. It's a generous nation ye are, and a brave one, and we showed our gratitude by fighting for ye in the day of trouble, and giving ye our fill, and many another broth of a oh boy. The land is wide enough for us both, and while we work and fight and grow together, each may learn something from the other. I am free to confess that your religion looks a bit cold and hard to me, even here in the good city, where each man may ride his own hobby to death and hoot at his neighbors as much as he will. You seem to keep your piety shut all the week in your bare white churches and only let it out on Sundays, just a trifle musty with disuse. You set your rich warm and soft to the fore and leave the poor shivering at the door. You give your people bare walls to look upon, commonplace music to listen to, dull sermons to put them asleep, and then wonder why they stay away or take no interest where, when they come. We leave our doors open day and night. Our lamps are always burning, and we may come into our Father's house at any hour. We let rich and poor kneel together, all being equal there. With us abroad, you'll see prince and peasant side by side, schoolboy and bishop, market woman and noble lady, saint and sinner, praying to the Holy Mary, whose motherly arms are open to high and low. We make our churches inviting with immortal music, pictures, by the world's great masters and rites that are splendid symbols of the faith we hold. Call it mummery if ye like, but let me ask you why so many of you sheep stray into our fold. It's because they miss the warmth, the hearty, the material tenderness which all souls love and long for, and fail to find in your stern puritanical belief. By St. Peter, I have seen many a lukewarm worshiper who for years has nodded in your Christian pews, waking glow with someone something akin to genuine piety while kneeling on the stone pavement of one of our cathedrals with Raphael's angels before his eyes, with strains of magnificent music in his ears and all about him in shapes of power and beauty, the saints and martyrs who have saved the world and whose presence inspires him to follow their divine example. It's not complaining of ye, I am, but just reminding ye that men are but children after all, and need more tempting to virtue that they do to vice, which last comes easy to them since the fall. Do your best in your own ways to get the poor souls into bliss, and good luck to ye, but remember, there is room in the Holy Mother Church for all, and when your, priest, your own priests send ye to the devil, come straight to us and we'll take ye in. A truly Catholic welcome. Bull and all, said the sick spirit, who, in spite of his old-fashioned garments and a youthful faith, face, earnest, fearful, fearless eyes, and energetic voice that woke the echoes with its vigorous tones. I have a hopeful report, brothers, for the reforms of the day are wheeling into rank and marching on. The war isn't over, nor rebeldom conquered yet, but the old guard has been up and at him through the year. And there has been some hard fighting, rivers of ink have flowed, and the Washington dollars have si signalized themselves by a masterfully inactive inactivity. The political campaign has been an anxious one. Some of the leaders have deserted, some been mustered out, some have fallen gallantly, and as yet have received no monuments. But as the grand review, the cross of the Legion of Honor will surely shine as many of a brave beast that won no decoration, but his virtue here, for the world's fanatics make heaven's heroes, poets say. The flock of nightingales that flew south during the winter of our discontent are all at home again, some here and some in heaven, but the music of their womanly heroism still lingers in the nation's memory and makes a tender minor chord in the battle hymn of freedom. The reform of, in literature isn't as vigorous as I could wish, but a sharp attack of mental and moral dyspepsia will soon teach our people that French confectionery and the bad pastry of Wood, Bracton, Yates, and Company is not the best diet for a rising generation. 
Speaking of the rising generation reminds me of the schools. They are doing well. They always are. And we are justly proud of them. There may be a slight tendency towards placing too much value upon book learning, too little upon home culture. Our girls are acknowledged to be uncommonly pretty, witty, and wise, but some of us wish they had more health and less excitement, more domestic accomplishments and fewer ologies and isms, and were contented with simple pleasures and the old-fashioned virtues, and not quite so fond of the fast, frivolous life that makes them old so soon. I am fond of our girls and boys. I love to ring for their chaste, for their christenings and marriages, to toll proudly for the brave lads in blue, and tenderly for the innocent creatures whose seats are empty under my root old roof. I want to see them anxious to make young America a model of virtue, strength, and beauty. I believe they will in time. There have been some important revivals in religion, but the world won't stand still. We must keep pace or left, be left behind to fossilize. A free nation must have a religion broad enough to embrace all mankind, deep enough to fathom and fill the human soul, and high enough to reach the source of all love and wisdom, and pure enough to satisfy the wisest and the best. Alarm bells have been rung, anathemas pronounced, and Christians, forgetful of their creed, have abused one another heartily, but the truth always triumphs in the end, and whoever sincerely believes, works, and waits for it, by whatever name he calls it, will surely find his own faith, blessed to him in proportion to his own charity by the faith of others. But look, the first red streaks of dawn are in the east. Our vigil is over, and we must fly home to welcome in the holidays. Before we part, join with me, brothers, in resolving that through the coming year we will, with all our hearts and tongues, ring out the old, ring in the new, ring out the false, ring in the true, ring in the valiant man and free, ring in the Christ that is to be. Then hand in hand the spirits of the belts floated away, singing in the hush of dawn the sweet song of the stars sung over Bethlehem, peace on earth, good will to men. And that's the end of What the Bell Saw and Said by Louisa May Alcott. I liked it. It's basically kind of just what like a priest sermon says. It They said the spirit said it, but really it's it's what Louisa May Alcott would say if she was giving a sermon at a church or a mass at a church. Um, she, um, that's what she would say if she was going to give a sermon, which is, is a pretty good sermon. Sometimes you wonder why there's not Chris, there's not um, women priests in Christianity, and then you remember, oh, it's because it's sexist. Christianity is sexist. That's why they don't allow women priests. But Louisa May Alcott would have made a good priest if. Um, she could give that was a good sermon. She she obviously seemed like she was a Christian, but she wasn't. Um, you know, there was, there was proof that she could have give, given sermons like that every week if she wanted to. But it's funny how there can't be women priests, or even there's not even that many women preachers who aren't um, under the um, Protestant thing either. Um, Protestant side of the faith either. There's not not even that many women preachers there. There's some, but there should be more. There should be more um, women in, in places of power, like preachers or priests. I think I think that would benefit uh, Catholicism greatly if there were women priests. I think more people would turn to religion for answers and to learn turn to faith for answers if there were women priests. But that's just my opinion. Everyone has different opinions. Let me know in the comments below what did you think of the story. Please subscribe to this channel to be part of the community. By the way, I'm not a Christian. I'm just, I do study Chris, Christianity. I do study all the religions a little bit, just to learn a little bit here and there to make myself a more educated person. And I, I like the poetry. I like how it's comforting. Sometimes I'm, I watch a mass on YouTube because it's comforting. Not that I believe it's true. I don't believe fairy tales are true either, but they're comforting. Sometimes the comforting is the, the comfort is all you can really get from it. You don't really get that much except for comfort. You don't actually think it's real. You don't really believe in God. You don't really believe in love. You don't really believe in any of that stuff. So let me know in the comments below what did you think of the story. Please subscribe to this channel to be part of the community. Please like this video. It really helps the channel out a lot. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.